strengths of community of communities and here. I was a bit late. Really stayed too long in my bed. <laughs> but the brotherly kiss of Steve. <laughs> Early in the morning, and so close to me. <laughs> this was a full release. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, also for your nice words about me. So, I will start saying to you that I was writing this paper and uh, this show together with two friends. Uh, one of them is Stay, he's a lecturer at the uh, high school in Ghent and uh, he was doing his master presentation on Maxwell Jones and his PhD on forensic pedagogy, forensic therapeutic communities and mental formation. And then we have Frankie recently there. Frankie is the director of our school. We have close to university, a small school of about 70 children with emotional disturbances you was risking it and there was a good atmosphere I hope when you okay. and Frankie was writing his PhD on uh, a special method LSCI life space crisis intervention based on the theories of rebel environment so very close to the reform pedagogics and the new school movement myself I was starting as a young boy with a heavy mistake. I went to write a PhD dissertation and I had underestimated my professor Wells, who was a very beautiful young lady, as high as this, but really an educator. You, you remember this type of women that are only wearing a blue uh, dress, white uh, shirt, uh, and white socks and sandals. <laughs> she had been the secretary of a reform movement in Belgium when she was young. So she decided, I went to Paris, and in Paris there was a meeting with Durand Gassier. This man for his PhD, he was writing a book on psychotherapy, some psychotherapy. It means psychotherapy without psychotherapists. So on the drug-free therapeutic community. And uh, she decided, because she thought that this drug-free therapeutic community, now called community for addictions, was a nice experience to build out one, to create one, to start up one, and to discuss the structures, communication structures, and way of uh, acting in this type of community. And I was the victim. So, instead of writing a quite classic PhD, I was writing a PhD on the work floor. Nowadays that's quite impossible because of the limited time, but I have got nine years to fulfill this duty. So, this is my background. I tell this because it might be interesting for you to know that I start from the therapeutic communities of addiction. And you will feel this in my speech. However, because of the school I reform pedagogics, I also will refer now and then to the therapeutic communities for children. Community as method, George D. Leon. Why? When, or as I told you, our therapeutic community, the team, was really born out of science. At one moment, we saw at the EFTC, that's the European Federation, of therapeutic communities, we saw that in a lot of countries TCs were declining, falling down. We saw that in Sweden, where there had been such a marvelous movement, there were no more TCs. In England, there was still and is still Felix House features. They reacted quite positively to the crisis. In France, there have never been TCs. Now they start up. Why no disease in France? Because of the influence of psychoanalysis. Uh, they, the psychoanalysts close to Lacan, did not like this type of therapeutic communities. And even Simon Weil, the minister had, let's say, uh, asked 
not to build out therapeutic communities of the hierarchic style. So, nothing there. Uh, Denmark won. Uh, so, in Germany it declined. In many countries it declined. Not in Belgium. We could survive quite positively. But we were asking, what's the reason of this decline? And there were socio-economic reasons, no doubt. Changes in philosophy, uh, in ideology at that moment. But there was an other very important reason, and this very important reason was the evidence-based, let's say, it, rage that took place. Everything has to be evidence-based and evidence-based proof. So when I'm looking for reasons, why were we therapeutic communities so much more the victim of all of this than? For example, the psychiatric wars are other places. And we found a certain explanation, and I will go deeper with you into that explanation, because it's a delicate one. Because one of the reasons I see goes back to one of the people I love the most, people uh, also you know very well, Steve, you know them also, that's the quite famous. George de Leon, who has been the godfather of the research therapeutic community, certainly in the States. George wrote a book, a book with an enormous influence, and this book was called The Therapeutic Community, but the danger was not in the therapeutic community, but the danger was here a little bit terribly model and the method. Because he called the therapeutic community a method. He decided that the main core aspect, the main core business of the therapeutic community was the chief of the community itself was the method. <coughs> when we started to think about that, and when we continued our thinking about that, we came to some conclusions. <coughs> what St. George's community has method, a method refers to the activities strategies, materials, procedures, and techniques that are employed to achieve a desired goal. The word desired is quite strange in that context. I don't know exactly why. But you see, his way of describing a method is quite broad. Strategy, materials, procedures, and techniques. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Nobody in the whole world really sees community as method as a method or sees that a method could be a community. George says it is a goal to reach another psychological state. It's something about the total person, the whole person. We have to change and the essence of therapeutic communities is self-change. But if you go in the common world and you look at the definition of method, then you see plans or procedures follow to accomplish a task or to attain a goal. Method implies a detailed, and now that you have the dangerous word, logically ordered plan. So you feel there is a contradiction in community as method. The desires, what we wish as being a method, the being together as being a method, and what method really means to the outside world. In the outside world, it means a structure, a rational structure plan. So George was building in a type of opposition between one part desire, wishes, and other rational thinking. This will play a role, a role in the further we thought, from our part of view, that if we could go away from this word method and give it a broader context, that maybe then that would be very positive towards what happens in this type of evidence-based research. Because evidence-based research is easily done about methods 
but is not easily done about movements. So we don't, if we define the therapeutic community, rather as a type of educational process, we could broaden the whole thing up so that those methods could be in function of the educational process, as they are in function of psychiatric hospitals and psychiatric approaches that were not so much in danger, certainly not in the countries I'm speaking about now. And education, where we were defining as <coughs> meaningful social interaction, aiming at a transitional process of growth and development of the whole person, his family and primary network, based on differences and diversity between participants, striving for inclusion by using intuitive understanding and rationally structured methods within an adapted milieu. If you look at your therapeutic communities, I'm sure that you can find yourself back, a lot of you, in this definition. Yesterday, we had the privilege of uh, visiting the Burberry Bush School. It was a marvelous moment for us with Mr. Diamond. And uh, we are seeing how nice he had composed this whole atmosphere, how it had created a milieu. It was very, very nice, but when you look, there was meaningful social interaction. The children were growing there within what was happening. <coughs> they spoke about the whole child, the family of the child, and the primary networks. There were certainly differences and diversity between the participants. And there was a striving for inclusion in that group, and I to my knowledge, there was a lot of intuitive understanding and at the same time, there was a lot of thought about that. How will we structure and how will we build out this behavior? So it is not a coincidence that it, this definition fits a lot with what we are doing as well in the DC for addictions as in the DC for children. As a matter of fact, I want to go back to my previous professor, you remember the lady in blue dress. She went, she was the uh, secretary of the reform movement for Flanders. Flanders is a Dutch speaking part <coughs> of Belgium. And when she was dead, when she was deceased, we did try to find back in the archives what was going on when she was building out her place like the one we still have now at the University of Kent. And as a matter of fact, I had to come to London, to the Institute of Education. And here I could find back the, in the archives of the Institute the letters that were written by her to the group of reform pedagogists called the New School Fellowship. And I saw, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> And I saw uh, that there was so much thinking that were the same and how those different schools were looking for methods and ways of doing and as she became a professor of education, it is clear that in those type of definitions they were built out on basis of those common experiences. So it's a thing of vice versa. Uh, it's a type of seeing, of looking at it from both ways at the same time, <coughs> the see and the definition. So, the difference between community as method and methods within education. <coughs> so, the method in itself versus the methods in function of education. The method in itself versus the methods in function of education. So community as method in itself versus the methods of the community in function, used in a community, in function of the educational process. Oh, I'm proud of this 
This is here we started. This was the Catholic community begin when we started it, in the middle of the church. I know this building still in the middle of the village, but after lawsuits and lawsuits and lawsuits, because the inhabitants of that village did not want such a large diversity community full of what they call lazy addicts, I'm sorry for this expression, in their neighborhood. Here it was much more accepted. It was a small community, then it was more difficult. But you see how by building out over all those years this community, how many reflections that come, activities that come up, and experience one has to go through. So most of my knowledge is based on the building out of this community. And I can easily recognize here with you the different methods we were using in that community. A lot of diagnostic instruments, motivational interviewing, relapse prevention techniques, family therapy, social network interventions, and use of experienced staff in the first treatment months. Why do I focus on this also? Because also in the work of George Dillian, it is clearly proven that in semi-experimental research that the use of experienced staff has as a consequence that people stay longer in the program. And as we all know, people need at least stay a certain time in the program. Yes, there is an optimal time, but not after four or five months. And if you see for addiction, it's mostly 40 months to stay there, and then you go back <coughs> into society. So we were learning that people that went through the whole process were much more successful. And that the longer they did stay, the more successful they were. And we did learn what influenced this. It was the use of family therapy, it was the use of social networks, it was the use of instruments, just by having psychological testing, speaking with someone and giving feedback. Important. People stay up. All of this we can prove part by part. So there is a reason why this is implemented in the CBQ, mostly in the first four months of treatment. Because those are the dangerous months for addicts, as you know, to quit and to go back to their good habits. And then, you have also a lot of educational methods that we were using in our small school. That's the school of the little professor and where Frank is now the director of. By the way, this is a very special building. Uh, some of you probably heard of Azambia in Turino, the great psychiatrist who did close down all psychiatric hospitals. This house was designed by a professor called Professor Hislein. Probably you saw also the Hislein Institute, the very large psychiatric institute in the center of Ghent. That institute was designed, drawn down, by this professor who was from family an architect. He was an architect, his father, his grandfather, so he knew how to do this. So he went to Torino, to his large institute that Brazilia closed down, and started to grow the pictures and to develop how to build this large psychiatric hospital. And we, we were very close to that hospital because of reasons of the past, because of previous professors in education, special education, Orthopedagogies were mostly all psychiatrists. We, our building is almost in the same style. That's why it's such an interesting uh, place from the point of view of architecture. What is Frankie, as a director, using there, and also the staff model? Once again, the diagnostic instruments for the observation. Then a very interesting technique, the life space crisis intervention technique. When people are in crisis, how do you solve this? Goes back to Red Dead Weinemann. Didactics, that's for the school teachers. Uh, action planning, that's what you are also doing. I did here yesterday. Play therapy, 
cooperative learning is also a technique that we are using of having children in group and learn and work together in group and express themselves in group. Also, uh, in the meaning of crisis moments, contextual family therapy, that's the therapy of Bozorensky, Nosh, the Hungarian uh, first psychoanalyst, but later more system thinker and developer of therapy systems. This man uh, was very close also to our way of thinking, so it was easier to implement this in our institute than other ways, and then we have the well known Rock and Walter and Now I go back to my evidence-based medicine. And I show you the founder of this. That's Archie Cochrane. And Archie Cochrane, oh, the quoting is from Kikero. And the now we say this in English, Cicero? Cicero, yeah? Okay. And it says, contrafacta non valent alimenta. Against facts, no argument. No more argumentation than you have an objective fact. That's the philosophy behind this. And he's striving for effectiveness, efficiency, coordination. All of this is clear. But very important in his way of thinking is evidence and hierarchy. Evidence has to be based on randomized research. Gives a lot, a lot of heavy, difficult, ethical questions. At Oxford we were discussing this. Can we do that? You treat, I like you, you have good uh, treatment. Uh, you know, no, the guy with the stones, you treat, unfortunately you have the bad treatment, or the treatment as usual. And you treat or the happy ones, you can have a special form of treatment. And now we'll see is there really evidence uh, that this method is better than the other method? But the way of selection is, is discussable, as you uh, can easily understand. But even that is good acceptable. Why not experimental research? Why not doing so? But then come this other kind work, hierarchy. They bring the whole system into a hierarchy of what is more evident and what is less evident. So, when you, for example, don't follow the and randomize the research, but when you have a bulk of knowledge on basis of semi-experimental research, that does not count. That does not count. Only very limited, very highly experimented research works. So, we did do some research for a Belgian group and we were looking for what gives us the best evidence. In the deceive for addictions, the best evidence is found for voucher-based intervention, motivational interviewing, community management, relapse prevention, and case management. Two of them we are doing at the key. Low evidence found for therapeutic communities, self-help group, and due exposure. Here you can easily see that the therapeutic communities are seen as a method. They are not seen as an educational movement. They are a method. A method with low evidence. However, this low evidence method is using best evidence methods. When you see it, as a community of education. The therapeutic community that had to suffer from so much criticism because of having no evidence was in large reason because they were called a method. And then in our disease for children, uh, we found uh, the best evidence for cooperative learning, for this LSEI thing, some evidence for equip families first and rock and water, and low evidence for play therapy and contextual family therapy. Based on this system of hierarchy and the way you are looking for what is best and what is less best, <coughs> going to the web of knowledge, web of science, 
looking for the A1 particles, mostly in the highest quarter, that are mostly uh, cited by uh, well-known peers. And if you are there, then it starts. Then you see the real best experimental research. And so you can build till you find nothing more any longer than semi-evident, <laughs> semi-experimental. And so they make this hierarchy also in the VC for children. Is there evidence in psychiatry? Is there evidence for psychiatry? For psychiatry as a total global approach? No. No. I could find me one quote and I will... Sorry. No. <laughs> Is there evidence for methods in psychiatry? A lot. A lot of methods are. So, you start to follow my way of reasoning. When we discussed and found this, we thought it's better to broaden up this whole therapeutic community approach into a broader direction. Evidence in education? Is there evidence for education? No. The very fine research was looking for evidence research on universities it does not exist. The universities that bring out most of, let's say, quite capable people with quite capable way of functioning in society, for this there is no evidence. So you see, evidence in education, in schooling and learning, you don't find it. But you find it certainly in some methods. Is that evidence for methods? Yes. Conclusion. If we reduce EC to a method, we narrow it and make it vulnerable to evidence hierarchy. If we see TC as an educational process, we can demonstrate the high evidence of its methods used. Conclusion. TC as educational process. It is important, remember my definition, to create an un unmeasurable, not to be measured, sorry, milieu that surpasses methods. Methods should be used for creating security and structure and also can provide evidence. How are we then in our school the creation of a milieu in our school? but probably in a lot of other schools here too, was based on the thoughts of Bethlehem, especially on the thoughts of Rendell and Weidemann, on social therapy and on the thoughts of reform pedagogy and therapeutic communities for children. The creation of a milieu, we try in our communities to bring a type of structured life, but the structured life also in balance with evidence, openness, expression to children and adults have to be able to express themselves. And it is an educational process based on human social action, based on a search for human dignity and prerogatives. Then, what we do in our therapeutic communities, when you go to the base of it, it's mostly installed an identification process in a disease for addicts. It's identification with an older resident who gives a good example, but in disease for children, also adults play the teachers, the masters, a more important role, not to underestimate the power of the peer group. And then, we think that methods are part of a global holistic approach that we all try to look for the totality of our activities. How could we now maybe better define and also to make us stronger in measuring our results? How could we go away from efficiency and efficacy in our results? Are there other ways? in which we in therapeutic communities are mostly much more stronger than people in other approaches. And we think, yes, if we 
used two main paradigms. The paradigm of quality of life and happiness. The quality of life movement is very much, very much evolved for the moment. It was growing out from disability studies. And uh, my colleague uh, who is sitting there, near Stein, uh, she has got her PhD on, on that topic. So, uh, quality of life derived from disability studies have two main roads. There is a more objective road that was built out by an American sheriff who was defining different life strategies for parts of life areas uh, in which you could uh, see how good someone becomes, how better his quality comes in the course, and a lot more subjective approaches. And the subjective approaches go closer to a type of happiness that is harder to measure. Thank you, sir. This is my friend. <laughs> I did try to bring a bit the definition of happiness in therapeutic communities in context because of the value system of therapeutic communities. So the energy and power of a person interaction that gives which enables her or him to survive difficult situations, <coughs> to reach transition in different life areas, and to experience happiness as part of an integrated identity. Here, the same, in the pursuit of happiness, a little bit later on that. So, if we try to find a higher quality of life, we have a lot of methodology behind it. We have a lot of good scientific thinking behind it. We have a broad experience from the disability studies, and we know, already know from the first results of research, we know that we score better than whoever in our therapeutic communities. So it's much more interesting for us to do this as a goal of our work, of our educational work, if I may say so, than to look for efficiency, efficacy, and especially for this type of objective results where you look so many years later and see if a person is still alive or not and what his qualities are and so forth. What now about happiness? This, this I brought in because an ex told me, you know, an addict is only happy when he got his stuff. Then he's really happy. That's what we have to pursue I was thinking this is in a very strange way, so I went through the old philosophers to see what they did think about happiness. And uh, one uh, important Greek word on happiness is the striving for eudaimonia. Demonia is a demon. Looking for the good demon, I love this. Looking for the good demon. You know, it's written by wife. Let us pursue in ammonia. It's just a. You know, it's a let's look for the good demon. <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> okay, but in Greek it is like that. Look for the good demon. It's. Another word for spiritual well-being. Uh, so, it's linked to virtue and reason. The combination of reason and virtue. So, their happiness is not something like, oh, let's take drugs, let's take alcohol, then we are very happy. <laughs> then I went to another one, the very well-known Epicurus, who was really, we know him from the mysteries, we know him from uh, the wine festivals, you know him from all of this, and we were searching out what he was really saying, but for him, happiness was not at all what we think, it was also a type of virtue, where you could use a lot of fun, but there had to be a strong virtue. And uh, the word he was using is ataraxia, 
And then we have Nietzsche who did not want at all. Uh, yes, Plato is there also, morality of great men. Nietzsche who is saying there are no values, there is no real happiness. Zero uh, who is also speaking about moral life. Nirvana of Buddha, the blessed happiness of Thomas Van Aquino, and so on, the righteous deeds, the roots of this. So, <coughs> I'm about there. My pursuit of happiness comes close. I have almost finished my speech, but I have to be sharp on time. That's for many minutes, you must have three, five times. Sometimes, quality of life leads us to shortcomings. Because there will always be a tension between the demands of society. Society wants this and our own needs. If I'm a soldier, I wouldn't like to go to Afghanistan, for example, but I'm a soldier. But I can be happy when I'm here or there, but there is this tension between the two. It's covered by questions always on philosophy, religion, arts and science. You cannot discuss quality of life without going into this type of deeper, deeper questioning a self as human beings. And another thing, it's characterized by powerful contradictions. We never know sure for sure what happiness is. And uh, all of you, even in the middle of the night, I give you my card, uh, when you could find out what happiness is, even if I'm sitting in my bath, I jump to the phone, I write down your answer, and, and I, is this really the truth you were following me now? And if you say yes, I will be the most happy man in the world. <laughs> and that's the end of my small... <laughs>